ready to uh, to start. Um, so I'll be chairing tonight's um, session um, of the IHR Digital History Seminar. And um, as usual, we'll have the um, speaker give the presentation and we'll have all our questions and comments at the end. And of course, we are recording, so when you do give your questions at the end, could you please speak loudly and clearly? Um, they'll be recorded. Um, and if you have any issues with that, please let us know. Um, I'm very, very pleased to introduce uh, Ruth Byrne from the University of Lancaster, where she's working on a PhD um, looking at corpus linguistics, um, considering particularly um, topics of immigrants and refugees in um, 19th century newspapers, particularly those found in the BL collection. And she's working with Ian Gregory and Andrew Harvey there on that topic. Um, and tonight she's going to speak to us. I believe it's an aspect of your PhD, isn't it? Um, or we're coming yeah. out of the PhD. Yeah. Um, and the official title is The Language of Migration in the Victorian Press, A Corpus Linguistic Approach. Over to you, Ruth. Thank you. So um, thanks for coming today. And thanks for anyone who's watching along online. Um, I've been told that that includes my mum. Um, so I've had uh, quite a nasty cold for the past week and a half, so I'm going to apologise in advance about to sort of sneeze or my voice goes a little bit part way through. So I'm going to start by talking about the 1905 Aliens Act, um, which has really acquired symbolic significance as the first piece of modern British immigration legislation. Now, in reality, it was quite poorly enforced and quite widely considered ineffectual, but it really laid a lot of the infrastructure that we have in place today. So, in the UK, alien retains little of its 19th century meaning. So, I'm sure that if you went to ask someone on the streets of London what the word alien brings to mind, chances are they'd say something like this. Um, but the words most associated with alien in the British national corpus, which contains a cross-section of present-day English, relate to science fiction aliens. There's a lot of references to the Ridley Scott film franchise. Um, but having traced the associations of the word over time, this modern meaning didn't really emerge until about the 1920s. So in 19th century Britain, alien was the government's term of choice for foreign-born nationals who resided in the country and hadn't undergone the process of naturalisation. And although exact numbers are uncertain, the process was complex and expensive, and many of Britain's foreign-born inhabitants remained technically alien, despite having lived in the nation for considerable periods of time. Um, so the term was frequently used in Parliament, and as you can see from the naturalisation certificate, favoured over terms like immigrant and migrant in official parlance. Now, whilst looking at definitions of the term alien, I came across an entry in the Jewish Virtual Library. Um, now, the website gives a potted history of the Aliens Act, in which they feel the need to justify the term alien for a modern audience. Now, in British law, the website states, the age-old term alien is used to designate someone who is not a citizen of Britain or its empire. It has no derogatory connotations. And as a historian with one foot in the linguistics department, I really felt that I had to take umbrage with this statement, particularly the last little bit. And I do this primarily in the belief that, as a linguist, I don't think any words have no connotations. Um, but also because the terminology surrounding immigrant groups is so widely recognised as being loaded with derogatory connotations, both explicit and implicit. Uh, to the extent that when you're doing the kind of research that I'm doing and when you're giving a presentation like this, you become really quite self-conscious about word choice. So I'm using the word immigrant at the moment, I've used migrant in the past, and I'm still not 100% sure which sounds best. So if anyone has any ideas about this afterwards, I'd love to hear about it. Um, that the term alien was used in legal contexts doesn't necessarily exempt it from these connotations. Now, linguists O'Doherty and Lakuta seek to problematize the labels that we use to aggregate whole groups of people, so labels like alien, warning us against viewing them as natural categories. And another linguist, Howie, argues that every time we use a word and every time we encounter it anew, the experience either reinforces our priming by confirming an existing association or weakens it 
Um, and what this kind of boils down to, what he's really arguing here, is that words are saturated with meaning and that that is context dependent. And if we really follow this line of reasoning, then a word which is frequently encountered in negative contexts will then subconsciously be attributed negative associations when it's encountered in the future. And I think this is why a simple choice between one word and another can have deep implications. And one of the reasons I found this particular website, this particular entry, if we go back, particularly striking, is that historians who study 19th century Britain will know that people who arrived from Eastern Europe and the Russian Empire, particularly those who were Jewish, were uniquely targeted by anti-alien campaigners in this time period. And it was their arrival into Britain in large numbers in the last few decades of the 19th century that's kind of widely recognized as the main catalyst for the 1905 Aliens Act. Now, if we look at the census data, for quite a while, the largest immigrant groups to arrive into Britain were from France and Germany. And this was the case in the 1850s. It remained so until the 1880s. However, as this graph shows, Arrivals from Russia, many of whom were Eastern European Jews fleeing persecution and economic hardship, began to arrive in large numbers in the last few decades of the century. And by its end, they'd become the most populous immigrant group. So although alien may have been used in an objective manner in official legislation and documentation, as immigration restriction became the subject of popular debate in the 19th century, the word alien proliferated through the newspapers. And I'll argue that the result of this was, as Glover states, a blurring of the division between the letter of the law and everyday prejudice. Now, this paper will use corpus linguistics to gain a better understanding of the connotations of the word alien in the 19th century, particularly the end of the century. Um, and I'm also interested in seeing if there was a noticeable shift in the word's meaning as the composition of Britain's immigrant population changed in these last few decades. Now, for those of you who haven't used it before, and I know a few people in this room have, um, corpus linguistics is the computer-assisted analysis of large bodies of text. And it's fairly ubiquitous within the field of linguistics, but it's only really beginning to be utilized by historians. And one of the appeals of it for the historian is that it can be used to conduct a broad survey of text and kind of highlight patterns in language usage, which may not be initially apparent to the naked eye. And then these can be downsampled uh, to a size which is more manageable for close reading. So I'm from a history background, and before I'd heard of corpus linguistics, I'd previously tried to do language analysis on quite large uh, newspaper texts. I think during my MA, I tried to do um, a sort of analysis of the language surrounding Indian independence in the Times newspaper. And it involved a lot of manually counting words, which isn't particularly fun. Um, so I also think that, that the kind of the current interfaces of digital archives, although um, they have many advantages, don't necessarily lend themselves to the kind of study of long-term language change, not least because articles need to be opened one at a time in separate browser windows. So as you can imagine, the idea that I could look at a words association over decades, over a whole newspaper run, and quite quickly quantify results was really quite appealing. Um, so as was mentioned before, um, I'm a PhD student, and my thesis examines the way in which different 19th century newspapers framed immigrants and refugees. And in the process, aims to really provide a case study for how a historian or how a historian with quite limited technical ability can use a corpus methodology to answer historical research questions. And as such, the thesis takes quite a reflective approach. And so it highlights a lot of the limitations of corpus linguistics, as well as the benefits of it. Um, but today, I'm really going to focus on results rather than the kind of issues I've encountered along the way. They, I'd be happy to talk about those in the questions afterwards. So I primarily use CQP Web to access my digital newspapers. 
Um, and in case you're not familiar with it, it's a web-based concordancer, which is basically a computer program into which corpora or large bodies of text are uploaded and it can then be used to access, search, and apply various means of analysis to them. Um, and it was developed at Lancaster University. So my thesis currently features five newspapers. Hopefully that will become six. Um, and I'm not going to talk about them all in depth today because that could take the whole hour. So to keep things simple, when I talk about my results more generally, they're going to be based on findings from this broader sample of newspapers. Um, but whenever I illustrate these trends or use examples or get up graphs, it's going to be from these two titles, and that's the Pall Mall Gazette and Reynolds Newspaper. Um, now, both were London-based, but I think it's quite difficult to talk about a national and a regional press at this period of time. Um, because, for instance, Reynolds newspaper was reportedly distributed in the northwest of England, in the Midlands, in industrial Scotland and South Wales. So it was read quite a lot further afield than just London. Um, so the Pall Mall Gazette was published from 1865 and its frequent staff changes make its politics really quite hard to pin down. So it began life as a conservative paper, but became more liberal after an ownership change caused its staff to walk out en masse. Then, under perhaps its most famous editor, Stead, it championed moral and social issues. Um, but towards the end of the century, which, as you'll see a bit later, is the kind of key period when aliens really began to make the news, the paper returns to its conservative roots. Um, and despite its shifting staff, the paper was always consumed by a more affluent audience. Now, in contrast, Reynolds was highly radical, and for quite a lot of the period in question, its masthead featured the blazon by the people for the people, which kind of makes apparent its populist angle. Um, it had a very large working class readership, and some historians believe that although you can't really talk of mass readerships in this period, um, that arguably it was amongst the first papers to reach any kind of mass readership. Now, it also had a vast hidden readership because low working class literacy fostered a culture of communal newspaper ownership. And there's quite a lot of anecdotal evidence for this. Um, and that, this includes a letter written by a man called Wesley Perrins to the Reynolds newspaper. Um, and he described his grandfather as one of a group of 12 men who paid half a penny each to buy a copy of the paper, and then they'd go back to his grandfather's nail shop, where presumably the only literate one, he'd then read the paper aloud to them. So it provided a vehicle for the views of its editor, G.W.M. Reynolds, a middle-class chartist and a publisher of cheap fiction. And the paper contains an appealing cocktail of political content and sensationalist reports of house fires, shipwrecks, and lurid criminal trials. Now, this chart shows the amount which each newspaper used the term alien, and it's been normalized for comparative purposes. Um, and if you can see that at the back, the Pall Mall Gazette is in blue and Reynolds in red. And it basically shows that there was an, a, an increase in the term usage in both papers. Um, and also that as a proportion of its content, the working class Reynolds mentioned aliens the most. But I think this is when working with this kind of aggregate data becomes more complicated because it's not quite so simple as that. Um, because the Pall Mall was a daily paper and Reynolds was published on Sundays when the working person would read the newspaper. So this means that the Pall Mall Gazette corpus is considerably larger than Reynolds' corpus. So it really comes down to a question of where you think the influence of the newspaper lies, whether it's in the proportion of its content, which it dedicated to a topic, or the sheer volume with which it mentioned it over time. And I still haven't quite decided the answer to that myself. Now, on its own, this data doesn't really tell us very much. But if we look at the collocates of alien for each decade, a shift in the wider associations of the word is apparent in both of the newspapers. So if you've not worked with corpus linguistics before, collocation is a method that's used a great deal and that I'm going to be using throughout the paper. So I'm going to just really briefly explain it. 
so basically, it's the statistically significant co-occurrence of two words. So if two words appear in close proximity, more often than we'd expect, based upon how often they appear in the newspaper as a whole, then we'd say that they're former collocation. And it's quite a useful technique for historians, as it provides quite a quick means of accessing the context, the immediate context, in which a word was discussed. Um, and to me, I think it's perhaps best thought of as the network of language which immediately surrounded a word, in this case, alien. However, um, the problem with collocation is that words are decontextualized and it, they can be quite easily misread. So it's generally combined with a reading of the concordance lines, which show the collocates in their immediate textual context. So for example, if I wanted to know how alien um, associated or collocated with the word immigration at the top of this list, then I could look at, um, say, 10 or 20 words of context on either side of the collocation, like this. Um, and I can basically see that it quite often appeared as part of the phrase, um, the immigration of destitute aliens. And I think maybe the bottom six or seven lines here kind of include that iteration of the, the two words being used. Um, and so, Another thing I did was, if this text was too ambiguous to really get a clear idea of how the word was being used in context, I would return to a more traditional interface, like Gale Primary Sources, to sort of see how Alien was being used on the original newspaper page. Um, and I think it kind of, I'd like to stress how important I think it is to be flexible with these kind of methods. So I think it's useful to see corpus linguistics as a lens which can be used to look at texts at a distance but that I think it's most effective when combined with more traditional methods and kind of the research moves back and forth between them. So here we've got a visualization of the collocates of Alien in the 1870s. And I've kind of laid it out like this because I think it's a little bit jazzier than that, but also because it allows more words to be featured on the screen at the same time, so you kind of get a better impression of what's going on. Um, and in all of these slides, the Palmar Gazette is the bigger cloud in the top left, and Reynolds newspaper is the smaller cloud in the bottom right. And that has to do with the relative size of the corpora, the kind of amount of collocates that have been generated. Now, the first thing you can see here is that not that many collocates have been generated for Alien in the 1870s. And this is partially because Alien didn't appear in the newspapers that many times. It doesn't appear to have been a particularly newsworthy word. Um, and I've also looked at the word immigrant, and it's a similar thing. It wasn't really used that frequently in this period to describe people coming into Britain. Um, alien was the word that was kind of favoured, and it wasn't featured very much. And you also won't be able to tell it from seeing this slide alone, but the main collocates, sort of blood, religion, um, races, language, they don't actually have anything to do with immigration. So during this period, alien was also used as an adjective to denote something which was strange or different, which is a usage it's retained today. Um, so for example, in the Palmer Gazette, uh, a man was described as being assaulted for wearing a top hat to a public house because it was considered alien to the habits and feelings of the locality. And elsewhere, various proposed political amendments were described as alien to the habits of the English people. And um, when used in these contexts unrelated to immigration, I think it's worth mentioning that the associations of alien were very negative. So um, I think although these examples are drawn from non-immigration uses of the word, you could make an argument that the fact that it had such a negative connotation would then influence how people saw it when it was used to describe immigration. Um, so here are the collocates from the 1880s. So there are a few more. And you can still see words like race and church and religion that kind of denote these non-immigration uses. So what I've actually done is remove them. So these are just the collocates which um, appeared when alien was being used to discuss immigration into Britain. And um, there were two, having kind of read these in context, there's two main themes which kind of emerge in the reporting in the 1880s. 
And the first of these is legislation based. So collocates like laws, non-residents and act all appeared in articles about alien restrictions being passed in other countries, particularly America, which had sanctioned the ability of immigrants to own property. And the collocates also began to feature in articles which discussed the potential of Britain following suit. Um, and this, having looked at refugee, this is something that was much more prominently associated with the word refugee. Um, as there were kind of really heated discussions in the papers as to whether the passing of um, legislation that restricted immigration would have an impact on the ability of people to claim asylum in Britain. So there was a real, quite a lot of um, kind of heart-wrenching stuff over this, a real, a real kind of emotive debate. Um, and that kind of spilt over slightly into the collocates for alien, into the, the kind of discussion of aliens. But I think the focus here was more on whether Britain should follow other countries' leads and actually pass this legislation. Um, now, the collocate naturalisation featured in articles listing the number of people naturalised each month. And um, these were often kind of verbatim lists of statistics, or tables of statistics, with very little editorial input, but often there was kind of editorialising through the headlines. So you'd get these articles, and this also happened with port returns, sort of lists of um, alien arrivals at Tilbury Docks in London, and they'd have headlines which would say things like, dramatic increase in alien numbers in June, and that, that kind of thing on an otherwise just completely neutrally worded article, which is quite interesting. Now, um, the other one that you should be able to see here, which is in both of these papers, is destitute. Um, and this really appeared in articles kind of concerned with impoverished aliens entering Britain. And I think this is something that becomes a lot more significant, so I'm going to revisit it in a moment. And um, I think, yeah, so here we've got the collocates for alien in the 1890s. And you'll see that the number of collocates has expanded quite dramatically. And to put this in perspective, that's the 1870s compared with the 1890s. Um, so there's all, it's, it's being discussed an awful lot more to be able to generate these extra associations. And not only was Alien appearing more in the newspapers and generating more collocates, but now almost all of these collocates relate to immigration. So um, to give Reynolds newspaper as an example, in the 1860s and 70s, none of the collocates generated by Alien in Reynolds related to immigration. In the 80s, about 30% of them did. And in the 90s, over 90% of them did. And I don't think this is because the other usage is going away. I think it's just that Alien immigrants were so newsworthy that it kind of dominates this other use. I think it's still there, but it's, it's virtually not registering. And I'm now going to look at some of these colour kits in a little more depth to kind of demonstrate how they were actually being used in practice. Now, a common tactic employed by linguists is to group colour kits together, which were used in a similar manner or expressed a similar sentiment, in order to identify patterns in language use. Um, and I think as well as revealing patterns, it can also change the way we weight colour kits, kind of the importance we place on them. Now, you may have noticed earlier that some of the colour kits only really associated with aliens sort of 10 or 12 times, which I don't know about you, but I don't really think that's that many compared to when you think how often newspapers are reporting upon immigration today. And um, I think it's worth considering that if um, 10 similar words were also associating with alien 10 or 12 times, then that kind of indi indicates that this collocate is indicative of a wider trend and kind of gives it more clout. So I think once you start to group them together and you notice similar patterns emerging, it does kind of change the way you view them. So for example, alien generated the collocates law, act, bill, which I grouped into a legislation category. Um, as kind of one of the main discourses surrounding aliens in this period. Now, linguists Gabriel Artas and Baker use this method in their analysis of the contemporary language surrounding refugees and asylum seekers, and they found that across a variety of news texts, several linguistic strategies were kind of repeatedly used. 
Um, and one of these was water metaphors. So they found that across all the newspapers they looked at, refugee movement was very often referred to as a flood or a tide. So this grouping of collocates can be done in automated and manual ways. And I decided ultimately to do it manually since, as, you, as you've seen, some of these collocates have quite ambiguous meanings. Um, and I think they really needed to be read in their original context to be sort of categorised correctly. Now, this table shows the collocate groups that I identified in relation to alien across all five of the newspapers. Now, um, I'm going to explore some of these, de these groups in a bit more depth in a moment so you can't see them at the back. Um, and originally, my intention was to kind of only include collocates that associated with Alien in at least, say, two of the five newspapers. But I actually found that I didn't really need to do this in practice because virtually all of the collocates I came across were quite common to, they were common to multiple newspapers. There were very few that were unique to just one paper. It was the same kinds of words appearing again and again and again. And this isn't just true of the five I've looked at when I've been and looked at other newspapers in the 19th century collection. It's the same kind of words that are appearing in the top 10 or 20 associating with the word alien. Um, and it kind of got to the point where you'd have several browser windows open with your collocate lists in, and you'd kind of lose track of which belonged to which newspaper, because there were there was so many similarities between them. And I actually think that the fact that I only really managed to identify nine main semantic, nine main semantic groups within collocates generated from roughly 16,000 results kind of indicates that Alien did have strong associations with quite a narrow range of topics. Now, I've thought about this, and I think there may be several practical reasons for this press consensus. So, all of the newspapers reported parliamentary debates, often verbatim, and it was in this kind of context that Alien frequently appeared. So, newspapers reporting the same speeches again and again and again is obviously going to cause the same words and phrases to appear frequently across the corpora. And this was also exacerbated by the prevalence of scissors and paste journalism, um, as editors often reused content from other titles, and this was sometimes attributed and sometimes not. But you ended up with these kind of networks of articles and moving between different papers. Uh, but I know that this has been a topic of kind of previous IHR seminars with people like Melody Beals, so I'm going to kind of move on from that. But I think it's worth keeping in mind as a kind of possible reason for why different newspapers were framing alien using very similar language. And these practices mean that it's sometimes very difficult to tell whether a newspaper and its staff is consciously framing aliens in a certain way, whether it's their opinion, or whether they're simply recycling the words of others. But I've thought about this, and I don't necessarily think it lessens the impact which that framing had. So if you think newspapers were one of the main ways by which people received information in the 19th century, um, and as James Curran indicates, they were often the only readily available source of what was happening outside the local community. And I think it's hugely problematic to try and establish the impact which individual articles had on readers. So as Hampton states, we are unlikely to ever read a, reach a satisfactory conclusion about the nature of press influence today, never mind in Victorian Britain. So we can't really know whether an individual article about aliens was skimmed over to get to a more sensationalist story, or whether it was disseminated and dissected in a pub or a meeting. But I think if a group of people, in this case aliens, was repeatedly spoken about in a specific way, then it's quite difficult to deny that it's going to have some kind of impact on wider public perceptions, even if that impact is very difficult or impossible to quantify. So to get back to the collocate groups, I think some of these were more surprising than others. So if speculating about the way in which aliens were going to be discussed in the 19th century press, it may have been possible to guess that they'd be talked about in relation to their numbers or their movement, but I think even these potentially predictable groups reveal quite a great deal about the figure of the alien once their intricacies have really been teased apart. So, when newspapers discussed alien movement, the collocates um, all related to the arrival of aliens at their destinations, 
So Berg, like landing, arriving, arrived, appeared in both the Palmer Gazette and Reynolds, but there were no collocates, which suggested that alien immigration was part of a wider migratory journey. And having studied the word refugee, I can tell you um, that it did associate with terms which kind of acknowledge this wider journey. It didn't just associate with terms indicating arrival. Um, and alien appears to have been, aliens appear to have been spoken about primarily um, from the point at which they arrived in Britain and became a domestic concern. Now, certain discourses were also kind of noticeable by their absence. So I was quite surprised when I found that um, the newspapers didn't really generate many collocates relating to alien identity. I, I think I'd kind of assumed that as anyone classified as an alien had at some point resided in another country, that this would form part of their press identity. But what I found was that aliens were generally spoken about in abstract terms. So the newspapers didn't discuss their gender, age, religion, politics, nationality, ethnicity. Um, and this ambiguity could simply be because the term was a legal label, sort of intended to denote a state of being rather than an individual. But if you look at the other collocates and look at how the newspapers were actually using it, they were using the word to discuss actual groups of people. They were talking about visiting aliens' uh, residential quarters and talking about kind of specific aliens who arrived on the docks. People were described as aliens. So I think this lack of specificity um, just kind of had the result um, of dehumanizing the alien. And I think you can see the same dehumanization at play in these images from the book The Alien Immigrant by William Evans Gordon. And this was published at the height of the anti-alien debates. So if you can't see the captions, the one on the right is captioned Alien Fishwife Stepney, and the one on the left is Alien Butchers Stepney. So they kind of demonstrate the word alien being used as a descriptor for groups of people on the street. Now in contrast, the word refugee generated a lot of collocates to do with identity. So refugees were spoken about in relation to their country of origin, their politics, their religion, their gender. Um, so here we've got Russian, Bulgarian, Serbian refugees. We've got refugees who are Protestant, um, Christian, Jewish. And we've got refugees being described as political, specifically nihilist, socialist, and communist. And some of this was because of the reasons that they were making the news. So a lot of refugees were making the news specifically because of their political activity. But some of it was just that there does seem to have just been a more multifaceted media identity surrounding the refugee when they made the press. Now, the only words that could be used to ascertain the provenance of the aliens being discussed were Jew and Jews in the Palmer Gazette and Jews in Reynolds newspaper. And even these collocates occurred very few times. So for instance, the word Jew only associated with alien eight times in the Gazette and seven times in Reynolds. And this is, I should say, within um, a 10 word span, so it's five words either side. Um, so I found it quite striking how infrequently Judaism was associated with the alien, considering how frequently they're equated in the historiography. Because um, the, the sort of as mentioned, the 1905 Aliens Act is widely considered as a backlash against the increased numbers of poor Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. Now, anything relating to absences is kind of inherently difficult to prove. But from a reading of the Concordance lines, I'm currently of the opinion that alien collocated with so few identity terms because there was almost an unspoken understanding of what alien actually referred to. And there's several reasons that I think this. I think the first is there were a number of official government um, reports, commissions during this period. And they generally had titles like the, the report into the sweating system, the report into alien immigration. But if you look at the witnesses being called and if you look at what's being spoken about, they're predominantly concerned with Jewish immigration. And also, um, when reading the context and reading the wider articles in which a lot of these collocates occurred, you kind of come across a lot of kind of veiled references to Judaism, including sort of veiled anti-Semitic remarks. And another quite striking thing is that when anti-alien polemicists, 
wrote for the newspapers. So Arnold White, who was kind of virulently anti-immigration, um, sometimes wrote for the Pall Mall Gazette. And he would often include a line saying, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm not, I'm not against Jewish people. He would almost kind of negate a charge that wasn't even being made against them. Um, so I think this all kind of combines to indicate that the identity of the alien didn't need to be spelled out in the 1890s because there was kind of a broad understanding of who the alien was. Now, one of the main ways in which aliens were discussed was in terms of their numbers. And actual numbers like 10,000, 6,000, 300 don't appear within the collocates. And again, this is because of their inherent lack of uniformity. So if you get lots of different articles using lots of different numbers, then no one number is going to appear often enough to be a collocate, but they were there in the wider context. But the collocates that did appear were those that were kind of more generic words to denote a large amount of something. And these included two which I'm going to look at now, which were the metaphors influx and importation. Now, importation was part of a wider metaphor which compared aliens to traded goods. And you can see some examples of it here. So we've got uh, the paper quoting someone, this is the Palmer Gazette, quoting someone who's saying that cholera is made easier by the importation of infected pauper aliens. And then we have someone, I think this is part of an election pledge, the fourth line down where he's saying that he would stop the importation of aliens and he would also close a very large number of the public houses. So I'm not quite sure how, how successful he was on those claims. Um, but I think that you, you can also see that the phrase import, sorry, the collocate importation normally appears as part of the phrase the importation of something aliens. And so I was thinking, how is importation being used in the newspapers more widely? because I, was, I found it quite a curiously passive construction for people who were arriving of their own volition that they were described as being imported. So I searched for importation of in the two newspapers as a whole, and I found that it was most frequently followed by cattle, arms, slaves, and corn in the Gazette, and cattle, arms, corn, and disease in Reynolds' newspaper. So in the 19th century, like today, people weren't usually imported, but rather animals, livestock, and kind of goods and objects were. And the metaphor really borrows language which characterized earlier free trade debates. And there were instances where this goods metaphor wasn't even explicitly present, but individuals taking an anti-immigration stance were accused of being protectionist. Um, and this seems to kind of indicate a mental link being made between the protection of British industries from foreign goods, which had been the subject of many high-profile campaigns in the preceding years, um, and the perceived impact of pauper aliens on British workers. Now, I think the previously mentioned um, dehumanisation was also apparent in the Collicut Influx, which appeared in the Palma Gazette. Now, influx is used to signify the arrival of large and possibly overwhelming numbers, but its meaning is also intertwined with water. So it originated from the Latin to flow in, and in the 16th century, it denoted an inflow of a substance like a liquid or a gas. So along with words like stream and tide, it's a 19th century example of the water metaphor, which, as I mentioned, a number of contemporary researchers have found to be very prevalent in the language surrounding refugees and asylum seekers. Chilton, who is a linguist who's examined metaphor in political speeches, suggests that once a metaphorical concept like water has been evoked, then it brings with it associations. So he argues that flood water is dangerous, flood water can overwhelm, and that it requires action to be taken in the form of flood defences. So he, he's kind of arguing that with metaphors like this, it's sort of, they're incredibly evocative because they play upon people's wider fears. Now, whenever I looked at the wider context of the alien, whenever I read the concordance lines to see these collocates being used in this sort of wider article, metaphors appeared. And like numbers, I think the wide variety of ways in which these metaphors manifested meant that not that many of them are actually collocated. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the issues with collocation as a technique. 
But for instance, the water metaphor was expressed using at least 16 different words, some of which are on the board. Um, and I also came across a wide variety of different metaphors. So um, newspapers adopted military language to discuss Britain's invasion by hordes of aliens. Britain was described as a dumping ground, the implication being that aliens were rubbish. And there were also medical frames of reference, as legislation was often described as a remedy to social issues. And although all the newspapers in the sample did use metaphor, I found that they featured most heavily in the Pall Mall Gazette, which may fit with the more literary style in which it's written. Now, although metaphor arguably dehumanised the alien, it wasn't always used in a discriminatory way. So Reynolds' newspaper included the following quote from Gladstone, and he stated that it was not wise for a country which exported a particular commodity to lay restraint upon the importation of that commodity. So basically, he's using a trade metaphor to point out that as Britain itself exported poverty, it wasn't really in the best position to criticise other nations for doing the same thing. And he also used the water metaphor in a different speech that was quoted in Reynolds. So Gladstone said that compared to the British labour market as a whole, immigration was simply a drop in the ocean. Now, the discourse which most closely associated with alien in all of the newspapers was poverty. So this is in the five in the sample, but also when I think whenever I've looked at another newspaper, you can pretty much guarantee that in this period, poverty terms are going to be in the top five results um, associated with alien. And although the historiography suggests that economic factors would appear in discussions of alien, I found it quite striking that this was sort of simplified down to poverty. So the ab kind of other collocates relating to economics were absent. It was really all about pauperism and destitution. Now, um, this connection was common across the press, as I've said, but it doesn't appear to have been limited to the press. So a quick corpus analysis of Hansard, which is the archive of the proceedings of the UK Parliament, kind of shows that in the 1890s, the phrase destitute aliens, sorry, destitute alien, appeared 62 times in the parliament, in parliamentary debates, which is sort of more than the alien, which appeared 49 times, and the aliens, which is 25. Um, so this does appear to have kind of been a wider phrase that was going around, and you do come across it a lot in kind of um, anti-alien literature written by kind of polemicists at the time as well. Now, if you remember, this was an association which appeared in the 1880s, and um, this kind of shows that the association between aliens and poverty didn't appear before 1887, which does seem to indicate that it was being associated with immigrant groups who primarily arrived after that point. So how were pauper aliens being discussed? So most often it was as a social issue. Within the newspaper sample as a whole, the pauper alien emerges as quite a paradoxical figure. So they're spoken about as sort of stealing jobs while simultaneously draining the poor relief. And certain economic charges repeatedly appeared in these articles more widely. And these can kind of be categorised under the following headings. So pauper aliens are described as providing unfair competition, um, kind of lowering remuneration by working for starvation wages, taking jobs and ousting British workmen. Um, and these criticisms were very often explicitly linked to the sweating system. So there seems to have been something of a moral panic in this period surrounding London sweatshops and the exploitation which occurred within them. The alien was also reported, this is kind of less frequently I think, to be the cause of urban overcrowding and congestion and a bringer of disease, particularly cholera. Um, interestingly, although it did feature some of these charges, the Palmer Gazette seemed to favour euphemisms over specific discussions of the issues it had with the pauper aliens. So um, it focused less on the kind of intricacies of job competition and wage undercutting and instead discussed, and I quote, the evils which had arisen in the East End of London. And it also used phrases like the question of, or the issue of, and I think question and issue both appear as collocates. Now, this reliance on euphemism may have been because the Gazette's readers were less directly impacted or had less direct experience of what was going on. 
um, but I'm still kind of uncertain on that point. But in contrast, the working class Reynolds had an incredibly conflicted tone. So Reynolds did feature these criticisms and quite luridly. However, it also, in other places, supported the concept of an international community of workers. It was a radical newspaper, which meant that often it jumped to the aliens' defense in the sort of the face of perceived middle and upper class opposition. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think Reynolds was perhaps the staunch and staunchest defendant um, of the right of asylum. So although it did complain about the impact of immigration, it was hugely in opposition throughout this period to the idea of any kind of legislation being passed because it would impact the right of asylum, which would affect political refugees coming in from the continent. So it's, it's really quite a conflicted paper. Um, so it cited reports by the Manchester Board of Guardians, which described aliens as industrious, but it also featured some highly inflammatory anti-alien letters from readers. Um, and although it didn't support them, it printed them and didn't negate them. And I think often Reynolds, um, the editor sort of micromanaged the paper to a great degree, and to the extent where he would footnote the correspondence section sometimes and write replies to all the letters. And the kind of he, I think he did that less as the, this period went on. So by the 1890s, he wasn't doing that as much. Um, but he, the, the letters I've come across that are sort of that have the, the anti-alien comments, he isn't commenting on those. So um, there was one letter written under the pen name Northumbrian, and Northumbrian said, and I quote, that the east end of London positively swarms with filthy foreigners who herd together like beasts. So that kind of contrasts with the, the whole international community of workers concept, which may have appeared in the very next issue. Um, I think one way of rationalizing these conflicting views is that Reynolds was trying to cater to the opinions of a very large and conflicted audience, which meant that the integrity of its political message was sacrificed on occasion. And this is an aside, um, but I think it's quite an interesting one that in Reynolds' newspaper, the poor pet alien wasn't always poor. So the newspaper was, as I mentioned, stridently Republican, and it used the anti-alien mood as an opportunity to attack the royal family. So in one instance, the paper interrupted a social, a social commentary piece on poverty in British cities to consider the fact, and I quote, that we have amongst us a whole tribe of alien and native paupers of the royal family, upon whom the utmost tenderness is lavished. And when it commented on Lord Salisbury's proposed alien bill, it often gleefully suggested that, and I quote, if aliens in England are to be cleared out, our German royal family will have to go with them. <laughs> now, to summarize, in the last few decades of the 19th century, the term alien was most often used to describe new arrivals into Britain, despite, in its legal sense, applying to a much larger group of individuals who'd not be naturalised. And I think this really um, kind of fits into the idea of news values and when we think about kind of what, what's newsworthy and what's not newsworthy, and the commonplace is often not newsworthy. So if the term alien was used accurately, it would have referred to German sugar bankers, French teachers, French governesses, Italian waiters, many other groups living and working in 19th century Britain. Instead, it was used ambiguously and consistently lacked specificity as to, as to who the alien in question actually was, instead relying on euphemism. Um, what it was specific about was the fact that the aliens were impoverished, they were arriving at quite an alarming rate, and they were associated with economic issues. Now, this lack of specificity, whether intended or not, served to dehumanize the alien, and really meant that the issues were discussed in isolation from the immigrants themselves. Now, perhaps the most interesting finding for me was that the alien was framed in a very similar manner by both the pro- and anti-immigration lobbies. So all of the papers, including Reynolds, which was often pro-immigration, generated very similar colour cuts. Both sides discussed the pauper and destitute aliens, used metaphor, focused on aliens in terms of their numbers, and discussed them as arrivals, rather than acknowledging their movement more generally. And sometimes this was because the newspapers were all reporting the same source material, like parliamentary debates. 
but similar language was also evident in original and editorial content. Um, and I think that's really interesting. So, thanks.